A big a namaste, big namaste for, you. for you. Namaste, namaste. And, 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 and very happy, very happy to give Indians, Indians giving, giving giving namaste, namaste to the entire world, world because of because this pandemic, pandemic situation. situation. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and very and happy, happy to get a distinguished speaker, speaker with, us. with us. And, uh, and uh, we will be, we'll talking, be on talking on the future, the future of work, astronauts, astronauts microgravity, commercial, commercial opportunities, opportunities and due. And due. So, I am, so very I am very happy to happy introduce, introduce Dr. Dr. Gattachari Gattachari who is a former, is a former NASA scientist, scientist and CEO, CEO and founder, and founder of AstroHub, Astro a Singapore-based and US-based startup dedicated to space force, force development, development training, training, and education. And education. Our previous, Our previous experience, experience includes, includes over two over decades, decades with NASA, NASA, a great thing, a great thing more than 20, 20 years, years with NASA. With NASA. As, as on more, more than, more than dozens, dozens of scraps, scraps including, including the Hubble, the Hubble which, is, which is very exciting. Very exciting. Had done had done lot of things about Hubble. I just think Hubble, 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 with the very priority with and work culture, both within US, both within and US outset and US. outset US. Our vision is Our to vision develop, is to develop a diverse, a diverse space for global space for She also plans she to travel. She also plans to travel. She also plans to travel to outer space. space. Travel to outer space. <laughs> with her husband, for the 50th wedding anniversary, we wish you all the very best, madam. We are hoping and waiting for your travel to outer space. And uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam, uh, always, always say, say A-B. A-B. And your living space. It's a great thing. That's right. And we wish you all the very best. The stage is yours, Madam. All right. So I'll switch on my slides in a second, but I wanted to say thank you for having me. This is a particularly exciting opportunity for me because just to give you a personal story, my parents are both from what's now Joshua in Bangladesh, and both of them came across the border as refugees at partition. And my, my father, father left India, India in 1957 to go abroad, abroad to do his PhD, and we lived overseas for most, most of my life. So we did go back to Kolkata and live in Kolkata from 1969 for a few years. years. Not the best time, time to be there. there. But, but I, I do remember, you know, coming back to India for visits on a regular basis to visit the rest of the family. And so I never imagined when I was a girl that I would have an opportunity like this. So I am really excited to do this, not only because for myself personally, but it's been one of my passions to bring India into the global space ecosystem. You know, not just the scientists, but everybody, every school ch child, the general public, people from all professions. So what I'd like to do is give you an overview today of the uh, International Space Station and the work that's being done there. So why don't I switch over to my slides? One second here. You have it? Okay, are we on? No, no not it, not it, no. Okay, one second then. All right. Um, I'm going to try one more time. I don't know what happened there. Okay, are we sharing now? Yes. Thumbs up if it's sharing. Okay, are, are we are we sharing right now? Okay, great. Thank you. All right, let me start my slideshow here. All right. So normally when I do these talks, I have the great opportunity to talk in front of live audiences. But in this case, we have this lockdown globally because of COVID and people are all in their own locations. And what I'm having to do is is work with two-dimensional images rather than talking to people face-to-face. -face. What I wanted to discuss with you and hopefully to inspire you with is the fact that we are now looking at astronauts in space on a regular basis. 
And it looks like my slides have been lost. Are we good? I don't, I don't see the slides. Okay, all right. So I wanted to talk to you about astronauts, microgravity, and the commercial opportunities for you. So the slide that you see here in the background is one of my favorite slides of all time. This is actually the International Space Station's robot arm that you see here in the foreground. And the International Space Station is orbiting the Earth. It is 400 kilometers above the Earth. And this is an image taken as this robot arm has released the spacecraft here. This is the SpaceX Dragon capsule. This is burning back towards the Earth. You can see the trail here. And this beautiful rainbow you see here is, in fact, the Earth's atmosphere. And this is the Earth's surface here. And I'm particularly excited about this because we have students that send experiments to the International Space Station for astronauts to operate for them. And this was the return flight of one of our experiments in 2017. So the astronauts placed the experiment back into the capsule along with a bunch of other labs and sent it back. And one of the astronauts actually took this picture outside of the uh, window from the space station and he got, just happened to get the Dragon capsule at the same time. So um, a lot of kids ask me what it takes to get into the space sector. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, as we discussed earlier, I have 30 years working with NASA and in the commercial space sector. I have a PhD in space physics from UCLA. And I worked on all kinds of spacecraft planning. And I started my first job on the Hubble Space Telescope and worked all the way through on different missions and now work with Astropreneurs Hub. And I do a lot of uh, public speaking. So this is one image I wanted to point out to you. This was probably the most difficult interview of my life. I was live commentating for the BBC when we were when the Mongolian mission happened last year. So in 2019, I was watching and live commentating what was happening. And then you see the altitude profile of the lander all of a sudden just plummet. And they were asking me, what's going on? What's going on? And without hearing the announcers at Mission Control say anything, I, I already knew what had happened, but I didn't want to say anything. And people were whispering in Modi's ear on TV. And um, eventually they did, did say what happened. But I have to tell you, that was probably the most stressful interview of my life. Other things I've that, that done that have been interesting but are not quite as stressful as I've spoken at the Women's Forum in Asia and um, TEDx and so on. So just to give you a sense of how long I've been in the sector, um, if you look at this image, it was taken just a few weeks before the Hubble Space Telescope launched back in 1990. And you can see me back here, um, one of the two Indian faces at the entire institute. And you can tell by the clothing that this is quite dated. This is not very fashionable clothes for these days. And this gentleman here is Dr. Ricardo Giacconi. He eventually won the Nobel Prize in um, physics. So it, I was very privileged to be able to work in the same institute with him. And he was, in fact, our director at the time. So I know you've chosen to come on to see this uh, YouTube video, and I wanted to just give you a quick sense of why I think that you guys should be interested in space. Now, why really should you be interested in space? Um, it's a regular part of your life every day. If you take your mobile phone and you use it to run any apps whatsoever, you are actually communicating with satellites. You're communicating with satellites um, hundreds of times a day. If you're a teenager, probably even more thousands of times a day because the satellites provide location services to your phone. So when you have a map application or you're, you're trying to call an Ola or, or an Uber, you actually go in and you put in your location and it's automatically received through satellites. Um, satellites are also really cool because they give you a large scale view of the earth from space. You cannot get the same visual information with um, any kind of airplane or drones. And space is full of abundant resources. Um, those of you who may have taken some basic astronomy are aware that the solar system was all formed from the same material. And we have asteroids that were formed from the same material as the Earth. And some of them still contain high levels of very valuable metals. We can take telescopes and determine what they're made of. 
And we can also look at their size. And based on the volume, we can understand how much these asteroids are worth. And some of them are worth like a trillion US dollars, trillion with a T, which is just a mind blowing amount, but they contain things like molybdenum, palladium, all these metals that are very difficult to get on earth. And the thing that's really interesting here is these are very small bodies, so they don't have a lot of gravitational um, glue, not a lot of gravitational adhesion. So the material there is actually sitting on the surface. It's been space weathered and it's pretty easy to get at. Um, if you think about the Earth's geology, we've had a few billion years of the churning of the Earth's crust. So any material that it, people mine has to be chemically extracted, which leads to implications for contamination of groundwater. But if you go into space to a, an asteroid to mine it, you would just go and pretty easily retrieve the material that you need. And uh, this has a huge impact not only for... Um, making minerals like much more affordable here on earth, but it really has an important um, environmental impact as, as well. We're already digging around on Mars. Yes, I know the rovers are out there and the Japanese have a sample return mission that's coming back with samples from an asteroid and the Chinese are aiming to do the same coming back with material from the moon. So we already have bits and pieces of technology in place that will um, go for asteroid mining. But what we're really here to talk about today is microgravity. Microgravity is basically when you're up in space and you are floating around. There's no such thing as g zero gravity because the field falls off with distance and, you know, it eventually becomes effectively zero. But there is a very, very small gravitational tug in outer space, at, particularly at the orbit, um, the low Earth orbit at 400 kilometers where the astronauts spend most of their time. One interesting thing about being in microgravity is there are unique pharmaceutical and manufacturing opportunities out there. We'll get a little bit more into that in a little bit. And since the director just opened with mentioning of the COVID, one thing we should note is that the post-COVID global economy will need solutions to many important issues, including food security. And this is where satellites can come in and be very valuable for food security and supply chains. And I'll discuss that in a little bit as well. So let me give you a hope of what today's learning objectives will be. Um, if I do my job correctly, then you will understand why we send human beings to outer space. We spend a lot of money and people often ask, why are we spending this much money to send just a couple of human beings up there? Why is it worth that rather than using that to solve problems here on Earth? I hope to provide an explanation for that. Then you'll learn how astronauts spend most of their time in space. And you'll in recognize the difference between two particular ter terms, terms, sorry, big space and new space. And I'll help you to identify online resources to enable, enable you to study further about new space and understand that rocket science is not mysterious and inaccessible as a sector. And finally, I hope that you walk away understanding why new space needs you, not just an elite few who work for ISRO or for NASA, why we need you on board as well. So let's talk about big space, which is that first term that I just threw at you. NASA is the best example of big space. The Hubble Space Telescope, which was my first job, as I mentioned to you, um, was a $4 billion mission, $4 billion. That's a whole lot of money. The Galileo spacecraft, which is the spacecraft I used to do my PhD, I studied Jupiter for my PhD. The Galileo spacecraft was also a multi-billion dollar mission. That's big bucks very elite access and high science return, but not much in terms of direct daily benefits to people here on Earth. There were definitely some benefits. There are some great examples of technology transfer, which we can discuss, but in general, these were super expensive. The other term I mentioned was new space, and new space is defined as the commercial space industry. So it includes big companies like SpaceX, but it also includes small companies like mine and a bunch of other startups or small companies around the world. I did this download from this data sp database from newspacehub.co uh, about a month ago, and at that time there were 1,780 startups around the world. And you can see that in India, there are a good number of them here. And people are working in everything from additive manufacturing 
to blockchain, cybersecurity, propulsion, robotics, space tourism, space weather. And it, this just gives you a sense of where the offices are. I'm here in California at the moment, and this is Singapore, which are where our other offices are. So there's a lot going into, on in terms of startups. And one of the things I'd like you to consider is what can I do with my own ideas or my own profession to get into startups? So we're here today to talk about SpaceX and NASA sending astronauts to space. And the first thing I wanna do is give you a little bit of a context, the history of rockets. And the history of rockets in India, I think is particularly interesting. There is a book called Pre -war Warfare in Pre-British India written by Koshik Roy. And he talks about um, using rockets in the year 13, in the 1300s in India. There's documentation of this. And what you see here are these two really interesting paintings. These were done um, in the late 1700s when the, um, the Tipu Sultan of Mysore actually was fighting the British forces. And here you can see a depiction of his rockets coming in and destroying the, the British forces. And here is another sketch of an arc that can be done by one of these rockets. These were revolutionary in design because they used iron tubes to store the propellant, the fuel, and they had up to a two kilometer range, which is huge. If you think about that back then, it was far more advanced technologically than what the British were used to. So this is a very important, um, this was an important advance in terms of rockets. And we know that they were initially used for military purposes, but then further on, you know, we became more into, we, we used them more for research and for um, other purposes. Uh, so to keep going with this, um, let me just give you a few facts about ISRO in case you already don't know this. Um, ISRO started out in 1962 as the Indian National Committee for Space Research under um, Prime Minister Nehru and Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, who's really the father of Indian, the Indian space program. And ISRO took its own name in the year 1969. And the first satellite that was actually sent up was the Aryabhata by the Soviets who carried it up. So it was an Indian built satellite carried up by the Soviets in 75. And then the Rohini satellite was picked up on, in 1980 and that was sent up by an Indian launch vehicle, the satellite launch vehicle. So 1980 was the first year that an Indian built satellite and an Indian built rocket were used to send something into space. Since then, there's been a lot of activity. We have a lot of satellites in um, Earth orbit, been to the moon and also to Mars, the Chandrayaan and the Mangalyaan missions. And in terms of the purposes that we have for space technology now, telecommunications, we already mentioned your mobile phone and how you are completely reliant for your location services on satellites. And astronomy is another big area. Hubble Space Telescope does a lot of astronomy um, and that's a wonderful context for learning about the universe. And there are other kinds of research that can be done in space, not just measurements and taking images of things far away, but you can also do biological experiments like the astronauts do. And in fact, that's the kind of research that's preparing us for human space flight. Um, so India has become reliable as a launch source to get satellites into low Earth orbit. And at this point, not only does ISRO's company Antrix launch for India, but they launch for the rest of the world as well. So with regard to these rockets, I want to show you a, um, a fun video here.
All right, I'll just pause it there. Um, the reason that I think this video is so cool is because this was the first time that this many satellites were sent up with one rocket. It was a 104 satellites. If you watch this video for a while, you'll see that there are more and more. So the rocket went up to space and it released 104 satellites. You can see them here coming out one after the other. And the larger ones were released at first. And what's really interesting about this is they had to figure out how to prevent the satellites from crashing into each other. And so what they had to do was release it, each one a little bit slower than the previous one. And eventually they, they set this record, which nobody actually th thought was even possible, 104 at once. So let's talk a little bit about the future of rockets in India. So we know that we have the Rohini satellite, and then we have the Astrophysics SROS satellite and the PSLV, which has a 94% success rate. Um, that's 300, they sent up more than 330 satellites for governments and also for new space, for the commercial space sector. Now, often many countries know, think of India as the, the country to go to for satellite launches at this point because this 94% success rate is, is pretty remarkable, it's pretty solid. And there's another uh, class of rocket called the geosynchronous satellite launch, and the first one of those was launched in 2003. Looking ahead to the rest of this year, this is just grabbed from Wikipedia, if anybody's actually interested. Um, you can see that the rest of 2020, there are a number of missions planned. And um, actually, I don't know what the latest is with COVID because I know a number of other projects have been delayed just globally. But this was the tentative timetable that was posted. You can see there were um, five different sets of missions that were anticipated. So let me tell you a little bit about astronauts. We've spoken about rockets that will take the astronauts up. So now let's talk about the astronauts themselves. How many people have been to space so far? To date, it's been 566 people. That's not a lot. Um, out of 41 countries out of 193 total on Earth. So one out of five countries in this world has sent up at least one astronaut. And you might want to define those countries as actual spacefaring missions. So one out of every five countries has sent up an astronaut, but it's still only 41 countries and a very elite and small group of 566 people. So when I talk about going to space with my husband for our 50th wedding anniversary, by the way, this year will be um, 29. So we have another 21 years for the technology to catch up. But when I talk about that, um, obviously we are not billionaires, I'm a scientist. Um, the, the thinking here is that the cost of going to space will drop very quickly. If you think about the cost of your mobile phone, mobile phone versus a computer in say the 1970s, you know how much um, more capacity your, your phone has than a computer did and how much less expensive it is. So um, my thinking is the price of a first class plane ticket inter and an international first class plane ticket will be about what uh, a space tourism ticket to go up to space for three or four hours might cost in the future. So that's kind of what I'm thinking about. Interesting um, astronaut fact. The first human in space was Yuri Gagarin in 1961. He spent 108 minutes up there. And basically all he did was go north of the um, Kármán line. If you know what the Kármán line is, there's a, a spot where people say, okay, you are now in outer space. How is that defined? As a community, we define that as 100 mi kilometers above the surface of the Earth. So he exceeded that, he orbited the Earth, and he was up there for 108 minutes. The first humans on the moon, you might know, arrived in 1969 for the Apollo 11 mission. And the first Indian astronaut was Rakesh Sharma in 1984. He launched up there with the Soviets and spent nine days in orbit doing research. And other astronauts of Indian origin include Kalpana, Kalpana, sorry, Kalpana Chawla, who spent 30 days in space. She went up on the space shuttle Columbia twice. That second one, as you might know, ended in tragedy and she and all the other astronauts lost their lives. And Sunita Williams, actually, she um, has spent 322 days in space on the International Space Station. And she's also gone up in rockets with the Russians. And she's scheduled for the next commercial vehicle with um, Boeing here in the U.S. to be an astronaut on that as well. 
So in the future, um, we've been talking about what's going to happen. Gaganyaan was supposed to be, um, with the GSLV, was supposed to take astronauts into low Earth orbit by um, late next year, 2021. Two to three astronauts up there for about a week doing research. But um, as of the 11th of this month, it has been announced that that was rescheduled because of COVID-19. And so it's not clear when that's actually going to happen. So... Having said all that about astronauts, I want to give you a moment of inspiration here. First of all, before any of the young people ask, no human beings have not landed on Mars. This is the surface of Mars, and this is me doing a really good job with Photoshop. So what we really want to do here is to get you to think about your future in space and to think about India's presence um, on the moon. This is going to happen, I think, within the next 20 years. Some multiple countries are going to get there. So especially for you young people out there, I would really like you to think of an image like this when you think about going to outer space and thinking, would you want to be the astronaut? Would you want to work on the technology? Would you work want to work on the social or the medical part here on Earth or perhaps in communication as a media reporter? There are a lot of things that we're going to need people to do to make this happen. So this is just something that I thought was kind of fun to look at. Now, let's move on to SpaceX. So we've talked about the rockets themselves. We've talked about the astronauts. Now let's talk about SpaceX. SpaceX is a private space company. It's part of New Space. It's part of the commercial space sector, but it is rather a large company. It's nowhere near a startup at this point. They design, manufacture, and launch rockets and spacecraft satellites. They have three space vehicles, the Falcon 9, and then the Falcon Heavy, which is just a, basically a heavier version of the same thing, can carry more mass up. And then they also have this capsule called the Dragon. And what happens with this capsule is it goes right up here and it sits on the top of the rocket. This is where the human beings are. This is where the satellites go. The rest of this is all actually just fuel and engines. So fuel and engines on the bottom. The top area here is called the fairing. And this is what opens up to release satellites or to allow the astronauts to actually dock themselves with the International Space Station. You can see here the rocket has all been left behind. One of my favorite aspects of SpaceX is that they actually launch and re-land their, their booster rockets, which is really actually quite fun. So the Falcon Heavy is a pretty remarkable rocket. It is two times more powerful than any other operational rocket. It can carry up 64 tons, which is a mass greater than a full 737 um, jet airplane with fuel on it. Um, it take, it's one third the price of carrying twice the payload as compared to the next closest competitor, which is why they do very well. They also have what's known as a human centric design. Uh, what the, the astronauts that just went up with SpaceX described their experience as being a much smoother ride than they had previously with um, NASA's rockets. So just to look at the commercial opportunities for a moment, what does SpaceX actually sell? They don't sell their rockets. They don't sell their satellites. What they sell is services based on the rockets and on the satellites. So right now they're taking um, people to low Earth orbit and they're talking about geotransfer orbit, eventually to moon, the moon and Mars. And the International Space Station is the most popular destination. And the reason for that is you can take... Um, you can take material up there to the, uh, resupply the space station. It's also a good altitude to launch small satellites from. And um, as of March of 20, 2018, SpaceX had over 100 launches, representing about $12 billion in contracts. So that's why I'm saying they're not a startup, this $12 billion. And their estimated annual revenue is about $2.5 billion per year. Part of the reason that SpaceX is able to bring in as much money as they do is their CEO, Elon Musk, you probably have heard of him. The guy is um, really good at getting public media. Gets a lot of media attention by doing something like this. You may have seen this picture. Um, a couple of years ago, he took his own Tesla, this is his own Tesla car, and he stuck a, a robot, I mean, sorry, a mannequin in wearing one of his new space suits, and he sent this car off in the direction of Mars. I think it kind of overshot its trajectory, and now it's headed towards interstellar space for the next, uh, you know, billion years. 
But this is pretty cool. It was just taking his own car and launching it into space. And this certainly got everybody's attention. And if you see the design here of the uh, spacesuit, this will look familiar to you in a few minutes when we look at the design of the spacesuits of the astronauts that went up a couple of weeks ago. So we talk about NASA and SpaceX having a partnership. The launch occurred on the 31st of May. Um, and after the launch, the a payload, the, the Dragon capsule that we described earlier, went and docked with the International Space Station 19 hours later. This is really a proof of technology mission. Um, it's paving the way for us to get to the moon and Mars. And it has a, definitely a smoother ride with the new engines. And what the astronauts say is when you hit Mach 1, which is when you hit the speed of sound um, here on Earth, they don't feel that sharp jar that you do with um, the, the, when you break the sound barrier that they did with the traditional rocket engines. And it's important to take people up there again, as we're saying, because of applications of space with, on Earth. So I'm going to show you this video. This actually is a visualization this is a visualization of what the NASA SpaceX partnership will look like. We'll look at this video first, and then after that, we will go to um, the actual launch. Notice the spacesuit similarity here. Okay, so I'll stop this here. What you're seeing is that the Dragon capsule has attached itself to the space station and now they are co-orbiting, orbiting around the Earth together. And you see that this is what the space station actually looks like. Um, the huge structures that are sticking out are the solar panels. And then you have the body of the space station here. There are four nations that helped to build the International Space Station, the US, a uh, the US, um, the European Space Union, Japan, and the Russians. So there are different wings here. There is an international crew that's up there all the time. They use each other's facilities freely. There's no um, sort of lockdown or one versus another. But this is um, probably the size of a large football field. And they're typically they're capable of handling six people per day. So to get back to the talk here, This is one of my other favorite pictures. You can see that this costume here, sorry, the, uh, the spacesuit, I should call it. The spacesuit looks a lot like what you saw on the mannequin in the Tesla that was sent off towards Mars. And this is the two astronauts, um, Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley, heading off to the launch pad. And this is the Tesla that they took. I just, the Tesla is my favorite car. And they took this Tesla um, on the way from the quarantine facilities where they were sitting. They actually have to be in quarantine for three weeks so that they don't give any viruses to the astronauts who are up in space when they meet up with them. Um, but then they went from the quarantine facility in this car. And you can see here when the two of them are actually um, on the space station, there are or this is actually in the rocket, I apologize, on the rocket. And you can see the displays they had, which are pretty cool. 
And then this is when they finally arrive um, on the space station itself. And one thing I really like to think about is broader access to space these days. Um, Bob Behnken's wife, Megan MacArthur, is an astronaut, and Doug Hurley's wife, Karen Nyberg, is an astronaut. So these are um, astronaut families, and I think it's really great that we have women as well as men going up to space these days. So now I'm actually going to show you the actual launch. We saw the animation earlier. So let's, now let's have a look at the actual footage from the launch itself. And what this will do is it will show you the launch. And once again, just like on the ISRO PSLV, you will see cameras on the rocket itself as you watch parts drop away once they've burned off their fuel completely. And you will also see the two booster rockets um, landing back on Earth in this case, because we talk about how SpaceX is trying to make these less expensive by reusing rather than having their stuff just fall into space. Okay, so what you saw there was a lot of things that are different from what we typically think about with space. First of all, there was a lot of noise and a lot of cheering in the background, right? Um, so Sp SpaceX has a very different cu culture. Uh, it's not as conservative as NASA, for example. They have a lot of young people there and they're very energetic. 
And they really do encourage people to be a lot more creative than governments often do. So that mission was the one that we're going to talk about today. So first of all, you had the rocket go off. Then you had the side boosters split away once their fuel was used up and they came back and landed, which saves quite a bit of money. And what we did not see is that the the rocket continued to fly and then the top, the Dragon capsule where the two astronauts, where the two men were sitting, that continued to fly on its own as well. And it went around the Earth and it came up here and it met up with the International Space Station. Remember, we looked at this earlier and we saw a bunch of solar panels and then we saw the different parts of the station. And remember, there's no up or down in space because there is no gravity. So you can actually ha be hanging on here or here or in any which direction. And because of lack of gravity, it, it just doesn't matter where they attach on. So I wanted to talk to you about this one in particular because the International Space Station um, is open to people of all ages who want to do research or actually do commercial payloads. My company has sent seven student experiments to um, astronauts to date. It's basically the same procedure that you saw on the previous slide in the previous video, where rather than putting people into the capsule, they were putting student experiments in. And so along with a lot, lot of other experiments and food for the astronauts and so on. So those experiments were sent up and robotically captured here onto the station and then installed with um, by the astronauts. And I'll show you that in a little bit. So we were trying to figure out why it is okay to spend this much money, billions of dollars, sending human beings to space. What's in it for us? What do we gain? Because of the unique environment of microgravity, there are some very important things you could do in terms of pharmaceuticals. Um, you can do very rapid testing because when a, an organism is in outer space, there's no gravitational ch uh, tug on the bones. There's no challenge to the bones. So people will, and mice and anybody, any other creature that has bones goes up there, loses their calcium very quickly and the bones become very weak. So just like you might know of an elderly person on earth whose bones are weak, they might bend over or they may end up breaking their leg or hip very easily. Similarly, astronauts in space lose bone mass very easily. They're not elderly, but at the same time, they lose bone mass. So it's a common problem between space and Earth. And this company called Amgen decided they would try and solve it with this drug called Prolia. It's an injectable. And what they did was they took some mice. This is a mice, mouse floating around in space. You can see this. Um, it, I, you can find this on YouTube. It's actually kind of funny. They injected these mice with the medication and had some controls on the ground. And these mice, they were able to test very quickly because of the fact that the lack of gravity had made them lose their bone mass more quickly. So it would be easier or quicker to check whether the medication was working. Now, in terms of rapid testing, the reason they like to do this is these drugs make them just mind-blowing amounts of money. They made almost $500 million in one quarter alone in 2019 just off of this one particular medication. So even a six-month um, redu reduction in their testing phase is worth quite a bit. It's worth, you know, um, $500 million, a billion dollars. So let's look at bacteria growth. This is another thing that happens in outer space that we don't really understand very well. There are certain species of that bacteria that absolutely thrive in space. And we think it may have something to do with the cellular structure, but it's absolutely not um, firmly understood. And one of the things our students did was they sent up this experiment in um, 2017 to um, look at tooth decay. And this was a fun experiment because one of the students had a younger brother who lost two teeth at once. So they immediately had a control for the ground and another one that could be sent into space to see what the differences would be in terms of bacterial growth. So going further with space technology and pharmaceuticals, um, there is an interesting phenomenon with very tenuous or thin objects being built in outer space. When you don't have the tug of Earth's gravity, you can build structures that look very different. And these are microscopic images of um, crystals. So this is a set of crystals of some material that was formed here on Earth. You can see it's a bit jumbled and irregular, and the individual structures are quite small. Same material in space gives you these long, sturdy structures that um, look a lot more solid and they're a lot more organized. And most importantly, you can use x-rays to study these very clearly, whereas it's quite difficult to study here on Earth. And so our students, in fact, also sent up some crystalline material back in 2019. 
But this experiment here was done in, with um, protein crystals in 2015. And then um, right now, actually, there is another company called Dover Life Sciences that sent up an experiment to be, with the astronauts to be tried in space. It's building upon these results. And what's happening is they're looking at the ability to use protein crystals to treat metabolic disorders such as diabetes. So they're looking at these proteins by themselves and along with other molecules, and they're trying to see if they can block certain metabolic processes, which could have significant implications, not only for diabetes, but even could be used if you can understand how to block metabolism, perhaps you can use that to even um, treat cancer cells to reduce cancer. And this is something, the Dover Life Sciences experiment, is something that is currently being executed on the International Space Station. It was carried up by the astronauts. Another example is this um, drug delivery patch. This is a company based out of Massachusetts in the U.S. And what this man is holding here is actually what one might call an insulin pump. If you know anybody that has diabetes, the insulin pump is quite large. Um, it's but the size, the best ones are even like the size of your fist. But this is quite thin, you can see. And it's designed to be just worn as a skin patch. And they're calling it the Evo pump. And what they're talking about here is studying it outside of the pull of um, the force, the pull of the tug of gravity, because if you can remove gravitational forces, you can understand more of the capillary action within the patch. So what they're trying to do is eliminate one variable to be able to study the other. So in terms of government um, technology and the space sector, we refer to SpaceX working with NASA. Now there's an interesting thing that happens with NASA where they have technology they've developed and patented and they want to have people coming in who are from the commercial side small companies or startups that take that technology and put it to commercial use. So this is an, um, an air filtration system that they came up with that they want people to commercialize for use here on Earth. And it's not just NASA that's doing this. There has been some very big news recently from ISRO, and this is huge. In, in my New Space India WhatsApp group, basically it just went crazy, hundreds of messages the day that this happened. Um, so ISRO has announced that it's going to actually open its facilities up to private companies and startups, and that they're going to come up with a new governmental policies very shortly. And this is just huge because this will allow a lot of people in India to have access to these fantastic facilities that ISRO just has there that could be available. So I'm, I'm actually quite excited about this. So let's think for a minute about the International Space Station program I was talking about. I understand that we have a lot of young people on, so I wanted to just share with you some of the things that are possible these days to hope to inspire you to consider the space sector for your careers down the road. So our current program is available to students ages 15 to 22, where they build a science experiment addressing a research question that they themselves choose. And what ends up happening is they have to deliver their experiment to NASA and get firsthand knowledge of safety, design and development requirements. And they actually walk away from this project, even if they decide not to go into the space sector, they have some very strong skills in terms of meeting non-negotiable deadlines. And their teachers actually get to attend workshops um, in on space technology. This year, though, it's not going to be in California. We're, they're going to be doing it by Zoom just because of travel restrictions. But the training is provided by NASA experts. So here's some cool stuff that the kids have done so far. Um, they looked at melanin, um, at genetically altered bacteria to look at the effects of melanin, magnetic fluids, electroplating I mentioned, Tooth decay, I also mentioned, protein crystallization they've done. They've also looked at plants and gut bacteria. And what you can see here is this young lady is working on this box. It's a kit that they get that they actually write a program on this little board and then they have a little physical system that they wire up to put whatever supply they want in there, whether it's going to be a fluid or plants or some bacteria. And then they send it off to run and the astronauts plug it in for them. And yeah, so some of these kids have gone on to some very prestigious universities. So it's a great experience for them and it really gives them an edge up over students that um, have not had hands on space experience. And this is what a kit might look like for a student. So what you would do is you would get this box, which is exploded up here. You can see it's very tightly packed. 
And you end up getting this, putting it together, and you hand it off, and then it's tested to make sure there's no toxic substances in there because there are astronauts on board the space station. And I'm going to show you now a series of graphics that show you where this experiment goes on the International Space Station. So this is going to be a series of slides that give you an idea of where this might end up. So the space kit I showed you before is here. And it is one of four boxes that you end up getting yourself grouped with. So each school or each group's experiment goes in with a bunch of boxes. And then you share with three others within the Quest Institute for California, um, of learning from California helps with this. And then that particular box goes in here into the yellow payload rack. And then that entire payload rack is stuck onto the Dragon capsule or the Cygnus capsule. And then eventually that is brought over here and the astronauts take this box and they will plug it in here to a USB port and a power bank for you. And you can see they're working here on laptops. So what they do is they will download data from your set of boxes and put it on the cloud and your teachers will be able to get that for you. So now let's talk a little bit about the year 2020 and what has happened so far. Um, SpaceX, obviously, on the 30th of May, launched Dragon, the first commercial crew transport to outer space. And the initial attempt was at May 27th, but as often happens with weather, they were delayed for a few days, but they did go up on the 30th. Um, on the 13th of June, actually, that should be, um, Rocket Lab launched Don't Stop Me Now. It's one of their rockets. rockets. It's a company in New Zealand, and they had a bunch of satellites on board. So they're not a competitor to SpaceX because what they do is work with much smaller satellites. You can see here that they work with Australian and United States it's universities to launch these handheld small satellites. And they also had some work for the military and NASA. And SpaceX is in the middle of launching a constellation of thousands of satellites that they will use to provide global internet coverage. And that coverage will be truly all over the world, even in the most remote locations, in the remote, most remote countries, everybody will be able to get internet on their phone is the plan here. So they're launching this huge network of something like, I think 11,000 um, satellites last I checked. That's on the commercial side, that's um, new space. Now, on the government side, um, this is a big month coming up for the planet Mars. And incidentally, let me show you this. This here is an image taken of the planet Mars from the Mangalyaan mission that has been orbiting. This is an ISRO mission that has been orbiting Mars since 2014. So it's been up there. It's functioning. It's been up there for um, six years now. It has enough fuel probably to operate for a few more months. And it's just incredible. It's been successful. This was the, you probably already know this, but this was the first time India ever tried to send a mission to Mars. It worked on the first time and it was below budget by a factor of, I don't know, five or 10 below what NASA usually spends. But every two years, the Earth and Mars um, come to their shortest distance together. Now, both planets, the Earth and the Mars, orbit the sun and they orbit at different rates. So every two years, they'll kind of catch up to one another and the flight distance from us to Mars is, and that's really when you want to go so that you have the shortest flight possible. It still takes seven months, but we have one of these meeting points coming up in July. And so to meet that in July, they're gonna launch several missions to Mars. Um, the U United Arab Emirates, they have not sent anything to, even to the moon yet, but they, in fact, will be sending the HOPE satellite, their first mission to Mars. And NASA is going to be sending the Mars 2020 mission, which will actually generate um, oxygen on the surface of Mars itself. And in late 2020, um, China is going to be sending up the Chang'e 5 mission um, to get a lunar sample return, which I referred to um, earlier. And of course, um, if you haven't seen this movie, movie Mission Mongol, it's really quite fun. Um, I would recommend if you are interested in space, just you know, try to get it. It's, it's worth watching. It's really quite enjoyable. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about um, commercial applications here. These are astronauts working on the International Space Station. Um, and this guy here is putting in a sensor system into one of these boxes. This is similar to the box I showed you before 
where you take the experiments and you plug them in and then you hook it up to the space station's um, power supply. Eventually, we're going to get to the point where we're going to want to do local supply chain. You can't take everything you need with you to space. That's what we do now. We take, we send food up, we send supplies up, and we, uh, on a regular basis, fly to the International Space Station so that the astronauts who are up there can basically, so that they can live. But if something breaks down, they need a spare part. At this point, they have the luxury of just letting people know down on Earth, and the part is sent up with the next rocket that goes up, and they go up every... 30 to 90 days. But eventually you're gonna to wanna to do things locally. So you're going to want a 3D print. And here's an example of a piece of plastic that's actually floating in the air around this astronaut's hand. Um, this piece of plastic is part of this wrench that they built as a repair, as a tool to repair things on the International Space Station. You can also build flimsy objects um, on in the space station. Remember the crystals that we looked at that were um, much sturdier looking because they were built in space. You can build those as a base and bring the material down here to earth. You can also bioprint organs. They're starting to bioprint human tissue up there in microgravity. And this is interesting because if you do send people to develop um, a, moon, moon, a moon base or you send them to asteroids or you send them to Mars, they're gonna need to have a way to take care of themselves in terms of medical emergencies. So uh, human health is very important for this particular context, but there's also another area that's very important. So on the space station, they, they grow stuff. They grow plants and they grow different species of plants to see what happens. And they often use hydroponics, which is the growing of plants um, in water. So in terms of plants, I wanted to show you this particular slide because this is not the International Space Station, but if you are thinking about getting into the space sector, there are a lot of really interesting things that you can do. This image here is from a company called Planet who images every point on the Earth every day. And what they can do is give information on crop readiness and health. So you have the farmer in the rural area who has to rent a truck to get his crops to market. Often that's timed very badly because people don't know when the crops will be ready. And with climate change, you cannot use previous year's data as a model. And so 40% of crops currently, 40% spoil before they get to market. So if you were actually able to use satellite data, you send a farmer some data on his mobile phone and you tell him, okay, this is when your crops will be ready based on the latest satellite information, then they would be able to tra get a, a transportation in a timely manner. And you can also use this to monitor your retail, retail, sup, uh, sorry, retail supply chain. Um, I don't know what it's like right now where you are, but here in California, it's very difficult to get certain supplies. You have to wait in line for quite a long time to enter the store. And even when you enter the store, there are certain things that sometimes are just missing, like flour. We can't buy flour here. And if you, you go to try to get it, they give you one packet only, and they may not have it for three or four weeks. So if you had a supply chain where the agriculture was successfully, the farm products were successfully able to get from the farmer to the stores, you wouldn't have this 40% wastage either. Another thing you can do in terms of image, images from space is um, you can look for fires, you can look for earthquake victims, and you can also use these images from space in the context of construction. You can identify areas of encroachment. And in New Zealand, in fact, there were some native people whose land was being illegally built upon by a construction company. And they were able to use images from space to identify exactly where the um, border was between their land and where the developers were working. And they were able to assess the environmental threats and also get the, the people off their land. And another cool thing that I mentioned earlier is this network of space-based space -based, space internet we're going to have global access. There will be over 30,000 satellites in what you might even think of as a mesh around the Earth. And SpaceX is launching a bar bunch of these in terms of their um, SpaceX Starlink system right now. So um, I've told you guys a lot of interesting things about what we've looked at in space so far, about the technology and what's possible. And what actually made this possible? How did this happen? It has to do with the miniaturization of electronics. This is an Apple computer from the 1990s. It's the kind of thing I worked on when I worked on the Hubble Space Telescope. It, in today's dollars, it would be 54500 And it's quite expensive. But we know that these days you can get a computer, which is actually your phone, for around $800 or less. 
So what's happened here is we've gone from this thing here to something that's 150 times faster, has 200 times more memory, and is 100 times lighter for a fraction of the price. And what that's led to directly is manufacturing of satellites is now standardized. Satellites are small and they are affordable. And this particular one here I'm holding is what's known as a cube satellite. We use these to teach in our workshops. This has a camera right here. Obviously it's a desktop model because otherwise I wouldn't just be holding it like this. This is for teaching purposes. But this is the actual size, 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters is an industry standard right now for satellites. And so there's miniaturized electronics just like in the phone and they are affordable. So countries that previously could not get into the space business like Vietnam or Bolivia, for example, now can afford to put their own satellites into space to look where they want, when they want. And it's interesting that we've gone from this to this, which now makes it possible for us to send astronauts up to the space station. This is the two same astronauts as before. And I had mentioned that they had gone into quarantine so that they were actually ready to go up and meet their colleagues on the space station without getting them sick. So in terms of disruptive uh, innovation, if you look back at history, we went from the horse and buggy to automobiles, to electric cars, and now we're, you have a completely different type of transportation where we're going to outer space and we are also going to the International Space Station where human beings are starting to live. Now, when in the 1800s, horse and buggies were, uh, horses and carriages were common, there was a whole global economy built around it transportation. You had to have farms that grew hay to feed the horses. You had to have somebody make shoes for the horses, build the carriages, hire drivers. All of that was very commonplace. And um, when the Model T first came out, it was noisy, smoky, unreliable, and it would backfire and actually scare horses who would start running and cause accidents. But now we cannot imagine our uh, lives without a car and these are basically just gone and occasionally people find them in parks for rides for novel purposes but in fact we are so reliant on this we cannot even imagine the days when horse and buggy were reliable so it's interesting that we've gone from here to here and who knows what's going to happen in the future so just one more cool thing I wanted to say about public-private uh, partnerships. We've talked about the pharmaceutical industry, and we've talked about medication, and we've talked also about rockets becoming private. Now, there's another really, I guess you would call it a mundane application of space technology. This here is the Herschel Space Telescope. I worked on this mission in the late 2000s. And this gold material that you see here is known as a thermal blanket. It's mylar. And this material was used to moderate temperature fluctuations on the spacecraft. But what happened is somebody who was very clever, not a space nerd like me who focuses more on the tech for space, somebody figured out that this material was really lightweight and really affordable and could be put into first aid kits for people here on Earth to use. So that was somebody who's not directly in the space sector, somebody who understood human needs and started this amazing trend to where you can take this material now and buy it. I found this just on Amazon, $1.69 US, and I'm sure that you could find it on Amazon anywhere, and it's relatively affordable. And you can see people use it here, and you can also use it in emergencies. Um, if you ever have tried one of these, you put your hand near it, and it reflects back the heat from your own hand so quickly. It's just amazing material. It's often used in emergency situations by rescue services to help people who might get chilled otherwise. So next I want to talk about the future, the year 2040, and this is why I really wanted to talk to you guys, because the prediction is by the year 2040, that's in 20 years, we will have a $3 trillion space economy. That's a lot of money globally, right? Well, we will be in a completely different phase, and we are actually moving in a different phase right now. So for most of my career, space technology has been a proof of concept, a proof of technology sector. You build something you put it in outer space, you see if it works, and you try to understand how it works. That's basically been the model, but we have now started shifting from let's fly something and see if it works to let's fly it, we know it works, what kind of products and services can we derive from it? And a very good example of this is GPS, the location services on your phone that we were talking about earlier. So if you're in the area or if you're um, interested in studying business or marketing, 
or media and communication or legal and finance, there are definitely opportunities for you to get involved. You don't just have to be somebody who's directly involved in technology. For example, if you're in business and marketing, you can help with sector growth and customer acquisition. Media and communications, um, they actually, I think, have the best job because it's very easy to get people excited about space. But then if you actually want consumers to buy in, then you have another, another challenge there. Remember, we were talking about having the farmer get that data onto his phone so that he could get his crops to market. Somebody would have to go in and explain to him why that's actually better and why he should put money into a technology he has no concept of. So this is where the media and communications come in. And of course, there are property rights in space. Who owns satellites once they're up there? Can you mess with somebody else's satellite? There are cooperative treaties from the United Nations, but it's you know how are these going to be enforced? We need some very smart lawyers to help us with this. Now, in terms of financing, yes, there's always a requirement for funding for startups. Now, what if you're interested in medicine or the biological sciences or social services, or you really just want to stick to engineering and science, whether in space or not? You can look at pharmaceuticals and space tourism. Remember I said I want to take my husband to space um, at our 50th wedding anniversary. Maybe you can help with that. Social science services, you can apply, apply space technology for the greater good. One of the issues that we've had with the lockdowns with the coronavirus is um, isolation. And how do you address that on a psychological level, on a social level? And if you could come up with services to help people on Earth here, it could also be something that could help people in space. Um, in terms of engineering, there's a lot of technology transfer. You can take technology like, say, if you're looking at farming and you take some of the remote sensing that you do to monitor crops in a distance, you can convert that to technology that you use in um, locally here on the ground and, and in outer space. And if you're working in engineering and science and, and space as well, you can continue to just keep what you're doing, what you're doing and um, push boundaries. So I had said I would give you some information on resources you can use. Uh, if you go to our website, astrohub.co, we have some webinars that you can just look at. You can go and study those and um, see what you think. We also offer some mas master classes. Now, these are interactive 90-minute classes where the participants put together um, reports. And we have one coming up in about a week and a half. So if you want to register for that, if you, because you've been watching this, there is a discount code here, BITM30, to get a 30% discount. And then that map I showed you of all the startups, if you remember that, that map was from this website called Crunch, uh, New Space Hub. And then if you're interested in the business side, there's Crunchbase and Owler and Space Capital. And this article here from space.com. Now, space.com is a very good website just in general. But this one here, I think, is good because it finds a, provides a very nice overview of the space sector from 2019. It gives you a good sense of where things were and where things are going. So if you do have any questions, I think there are a lot of good resources out there right now for you to be able to use. So finally, it's really, fantastic. it's really fantastic and mind blowing talk, madam. Okay, uh, great. We are, yeah, we are really thrilled actually. I really enjoyed it. I could not even move a second from your, from the computer. So I really enjoyed it. We salute you. Not only that, madam, if you happen to come to Calcutta, we'll be very, very happy to welcome you to Birla Industrial and Technological Museum for a one to one talk with the children. Oh, that would be great. So much Knowledge and so much of experience and fantastic slide presentation. You are a great and excellent speaker. We'll be very, very happy to get you if you come to Calcutta. I will be the first or, yeah. to grab you and take you to the land. Okay. And there are some questions, some questions. Before that, I had to summarize a bit. You have really talked beautifully about the commercial exploitation of space. It is a fantastic thing. And three trillion dollar is mind blowing thing. It's By mind blowing. Twenty forty, yes, you are yes. mm -hmm. And you were talking about the spin off also, especially the Myla. Myla, I was really wonderstruck when I was uh, just uh, listening to it. And you were talking about food security, natural disaster, construction, space, uh, internet. Everything is there, and it's a great thing. I'll just go to some two, three questions. There are plenty of questions. We have chosen some questions because I know that a construction of time. So let me go to one or, one or some two, three questions. Uh, the first question which I like is, 
then we will have the first astronaut from india in the international space station what is your idea i when will we have the first one up there um you know i don't think that there are any plans right now india is quite interested in sending its own astronauts to space in its own spacecraft and that's really where the focus is but i also want to point out that the international space station started operating in 2001 it's quite old and there are many commercial companies out there that are looking right now at the process of building their own space stations so i would set my eyes more towards those rather than specifically at the international space station and um these young people that are listening i think it's entirely realistic for them to think that by the time they're 30 or 40 years old they might actually be going to space that's a great word it's really a really very really encouraging word actually and one more question uh, from mr prakash datta what are the technologies which are utilized for planning if it is any for clearing the space junks what are the technologies for for sorry creating or cleaning up for cleaning cleaning or for clearing cleaning, the yeah. space junk if it is there Space junk. Now that's a very good question. So the question is, how do you clean up trash in space? So if you think about humanity, two hundred years ago, um, everybody would just throw things in the water. They would throw things in the ocean. No one thought that we would have an environmental disaster on our hands. And today we know the oceans here on Earth are quite polluted. So um, if we're going to be smart as a species, what we want to do is ensure that outer space stays clean and that we are responsible. So there are two things that you can do. One is you can guarantee that whatever you send up there will eventually once it stops working not just keep orbiting but will fall to earth and burn up in the upper atmosphere. And there is a cooperative treaty the United Nations has where people have agreed to do just that. Um and they're also talking about deorbiting other in other ways just attaching to big old satellites attaching mechanisms to them to bring them back down to the earth because if you think about space debris anything that's moving even the tiniest little piece that breaks it off of something if it's moving at 20,000 kilometers per hour it's going to be able to damage something very quickly right so we want to be careful and make sure that that doesn't happen and there are some startups out there that are talking about using magnets or space nets um to be able to scoop up these bits of junk and then bring them back to earth So it's a growing sector there's not a lot of interest by countries yet because what do you what's the benefit of spending extra money on cleaning up the people who are interested in that are the insurance companies because when you send your satellite up when you send up your rocket you have to pay for insurance a company has to pay insurance and so the insurance companies that insure space assets are quite interested in this technology fantastic i fully agree with you because without uh, money coming back nobody will invest in this that is right, important yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, another interesting question is how isro can collaborate with other famous space research institutes whether any footing is there any any already any planning is there oh, like that happens all all the time you know, quite frequently you have international missions so one country sends up a spacecraft and other countries will provide sensors and they will provide instrumentation i mean it's a fairly regular thing and scientists globally all know each other so there's a lot of cooperation but it's a fairly regular happening to have one country provide this technology and another country provide a lot and because space is very expensive right and so for example when i worked on the herschel space observatory that was a european space agency mission but i worked for nasa we provided a lot of support to them and so we would go back and forth so there are many examples of this between the japanese and the indians and the europeans and the americans and also the the russians today yeah 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 collaboration is the right way to manage economy that is also yes. the right thing that's yeah. right that's right yeah another interesting question is uh, is it possible to harvest more solar energy from outer space for use in earth I don't know how it is possible. Is it is possible it? to harvest more uh harvest more solar energy and beam it back down to earth. So I guess the person is imagining a huge planet-sized solar panels out there that send energy back down to earth. Um in terms of harvesting it's a matter of surface area. Um I guess it would depend on the technology you use to bring that kind of energy back down to earth. 
Um, it's certainly not out of the question. There are people that, you know, talk about this kind of thing being possible someday. But I would think that the, there are two issues. One is the efficiency of our solar cells still isn't very good. We'd have to improve that. And then we'd have to figure out a way to safely, safely transmit all that power down for people on Earth to use. Yeah. Uh, and this will be the last question. I don't want to uh, talk too much. Is, is there any collaborative project or fellowship program for Indian students? This is one of the students who was asked. All right. I'm glad that when students ask these questions, that means they are interested. That's great. Um, ISRO does have some programs. How do I say this? The world, some countries in this world are a lot less cooperative now than they used to be. Um, the U.S., for example, they have put some visa restrictions in place, which is eventually going to be a problem here because so much of our talent comes from Asia, from South Asia in particular. Um, I don't know of any fellowships particularly in India, I'm afraid, because I'm not an expert, but um, I think you might be able to look up. I know that there's the um, Indian Institute of Space Sciences and um, ISRO is opening up, so because they're interested in bringing in startups and making more of a public outreach now, I'm sure that they're looking very much more deeply into education activities than they used to. Yes, madam, it is a good news that ISRO is opening up because of which yeah. a lot of industries will be benefited and there will be a lot of uh, industries which will be coming up. Yeah. And, uh, to be on the lighter side, I would like to conclude by telling that uh, I read it somewhere. It's a very interesting thing. Uh, thank God uh, we are not having the power to fly like uh, birds. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you would have polluted the entire space. <laughs> that yes. is, I read it somewhere. So now the space junk is going to be another big problem for us. Yes, and yes. as you rightly told, the insurance industry has to worry about it. Okay. And I rightly Again, I would like to welcome you to Birla Industrial and Technological Museum. When you visit uh, Calcutta, kindly keep in touch with us. Yes. You may be knowing that this is the oldest science center in the Government of India setup. We yep. opened our portals 61 years back in the year 1959. Uh -huh. We started a uh, science center. With a, right now, we have got 11 science galleries, and we are doing a lot of activities, outreach activities also. And we are very, very happy to have you with us and uh, talk about space technology and okay. talk to you about the commercial space technology. And we really salute you and a big namaste to you once again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks a lot, madam. Good night for you now. Okay.